It was changing, but I was still getting the top A's on Ave Maria. We were still of the opinion that his voice was still very much just a treble voice. This is the interesting thing. You are right to say your voice was changing mm. on Chorus of the Year. Most boys who get that far, they do have changing voices. We rarely, mm. rarely hear an unchanged voice on Chorus of the Year. And you're expected to behave, well, more than like a professional, really. You're expected just to do exactly as you're told, to stand exactly where you're told, to wait as long as you yeah. need to, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I just want, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that? Would you agree with that, kind of? Is it yeah. slightly strange? So that was May It Be, that was recorded in May Go on. August 2021. August 2021. So whereabouts in my voice change journey do you reckon that was, Martin? Well, that's interesting you should ask that because May It Be is an interesting song. Mm, yes. And um, there's quite a lot about it in the new book. Yes. And one of the reasons is it was previously recorded by a boy called Dominic Byrne. I oh, think he called himself Inigo Byrne back in 2005 and we used Dominic's recording in the Boys Keep Singing films as an example of where your voice was when you recorded it if that makes sense mm. and where it was was what we call cambiata okay um now people misunderstand cambiata they think it's just like a you know sort of tenory voice but it isn't it's actually higher the first stage of cambiata so your voice was at that stage where it could still sing up to a top g if yeah. it wanted but it was more comfortable and richer yeah down in the range from middle to treble C, perhaps yeah. down as far as A, yeah, which is exactly where May B was. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing for me on this is May B was an Enya song. Yes. Um, and I had some interesting reactions when I played Dominic's May B in, in schools. Um, boys who did a lot of singing thought it was beautiful. But boys who didn't thought it wasn't as good as Enya. Mm. Now, what's your reaction to that? And how do you position yourself against Enya? Um, well, I think I did it very differently to how Enya did it, um, as with most of my songs, a much more kind of a different take on the song and a different way of singing it and sounds a lot different to the original. And, uh, yeah, I think that that's just generally just different, so it's not really comparable is that word yeah mm, comparable 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 yeah to yeah um, interesting to because i think i recall simon cowell in his judgment on that day oh, yeah. of your performance of run yeah he said you made that your own song cormac yes i think you probably did and you yeah. do it was a very different to the the snow patrol version um i think Kind of unintentionally, I've done that with most of my songs, just kind of doing it my own way, not really giving it a second thought until people point it out, yeah. Well, that's probably, you know, part of why you've been good at this, because you're Thank not you. just a boy singing, you're, you're an artist, even at the age of 12. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I think I can say that without... Yeah. You know. Good. Do you agree, Matthew? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting as well with me. It be that being from Lord of the Rings, um, you can see different points in the score of Lord of the Rings as well. Where if there's something particularly otherworldly, fantastical going on, like you know moments where Gandalf turns up, you actually get that pure, clear treble voice coming through. Yeah. So it's obviously the go-to sound for people that want to express something yeah. ethereal, and yeah, it would seem like that would also be magical, true kind of, yeah. even when it's at a, that that can be at a stage as well that it has that unique kind of quality. Yeah. Um, 
Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I agree. And the the problem with Cambiata is that that first stage of Cambiata, when they could still sing treble, um, in most choirs they do. And you never hear the Cambiata voice Mm. the way um, Irving Cooper, whose idea it was, originated it and, and thought it should sound. It is that low treble sound rather than a scrawny young you know it hasn't gone down to that yet so uh, that's why I think Cormac's later songs are so successful mm-hmm. I think that the other difference with the Enya song was the actual accompaniment we with working with Dominic Ferris and not then having massive budgets to work with lots of other musicians because that's where your money comes in uh we were very fortunate in that that vocal piano combination with the two of them working so well together is what also makes may it be very different to Enya's because it doesn't have the additional production that her song has with all the different moody instruments that come in absolutely i think you're spot on there alison and now cormac and and dominic ferris work brilliantly together they're a fantastic combination no doubt about that that piano vocal is it creates that magical sound it really Mm. does but i think with the way that it has been recorded as well (laughs) the way cormac's vocal has been recorded by simon (coughs) hanhart the whole sort of aspect of the purity of his voice is very much preserved in those recordings and that's been a conscious decision with the whole of the team that have recorded the music with him. I've always been um, particularly drawn to art song you know which is that uh, piano and vocal uh, for Mm. that reason uh, because it's all about the performance and that like you mentioned being in the zone Cormac you know when you're in the zone and uh you've got that invisible connection between the pianist and the singer and it's just this <clears throat> kind of relationship that's happening invisibly. Um, it is the most amazing thing. Um, it's amazing to experience, I'm sure you would agree. Um, and I think for a lot of people, though they can't put their finger on why, it's amazing to listen to as well. Yeah. And I think partly by design and all credit to you, but partly you know, by good fortune, you know, mm-hmm. You landed on that with Dominic, the fact that you're obviously both, you know, brilliant performers and were able to bring out the best in each other in a way that um, people who wouldn't technically be able to understand what was going on just listened to anything and, and realised that they were listening to a kind of next level performance. Mm, I think you're right to equate it to art song, mm. actually. Uh, and it is that close relationship between the accompanist and the singer. Yeah. Mm. You're, you're right. And that is so crucial. And that is really what Dominic Ferris does do exceptionally well. Yeah. You know, Cormac has been accompanied by pianists and then he's been accompanied by Dominic Ferris. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Cormac, but it's worlds apart. Would yeah, you agree? definitely. Um, Dominic's a different level. He just Each take he does is completely different. He doesn't actually read the music. He doesn't obey the music. He just he what listens to the flow of it and just creates it on the spot. And it's, it's really amazing to watch. Um, and he's very, very talented. And the amount of emotion that he puts into the piano as well is phenomenal. You even just have to watch the videos just to see him, like, just how into it he is. Mm. Um, it is quite it's quite phenomenal to watch, yeah. And to hear, <laughs> and to hear, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I th- and I do think that's worth emphasising because obviously, for the vast majority of people, that's just not even a context that's in their mind, is it? You mm. know, the, the kind of mass media that would be consuming the likes of Britain's Got Talent, which of course you did very well on as well, but mm. it's backing tracks, isn't it? Usually, you're standing yeah. up, you have to sing to a click track. You're not, yeah. you're not encouraged to off road and no. you know pull the tempo yeah. around. <laughs> it's not going to work, is it? Mm. So it's it's still a performance. It's still a very valid form of performance, but it's a completely different form of performance. And for some people, they've just never experienced that. Yeah. Um, 90% of all the tracks that Cormac has recorded with Dominic have not been to a click track. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's I think been we did one, one, which was Angel, wasn't yeah, it? With the click. And we did try Angel no, without it. That was only because Dominic got the piano track um, like on the second take or something like that. Um and then that was it. And then it was just me in this booth for 
quite a while on that one, yeah. I think it was. Mm. And we popped a, mm. a click on it, and then we really did get that one off. Um, that was a good, that, that, I, I, I'm really happy with that one. Mm. That's a good little song. But the combination, we're very fortunate, has worked so well together. Yeah. yeah. And they both complement each other so well. But I think, you know, versus, you know, if we look at it, Cormac, from a studio perspective and working in the studio with Dominic, going back to what Matthew said about when you do then go into the likes of BGT and you are singing to a track, tell us a little bit about the BGT experience and what it was like to be on Britain's Got Talent singing run specifically because what we'd like to then get to is how it was then to sing run six months later in your six month older voice and the difference between the two so it's January 2022 now and you're at the London Palladium singing run for Simon Cowell and the team so in 2020 when I was singing run it was uh, very much high and up here, and uh, the high notes are very much easy to get. Cause my voice hadn't changed at all then. But then once my voice had started changing when I was 12 in 2022, uh, January time-ish, yeah, uh, with a BGT with the judges, that was that was a lot different. I think the key for the track that we did might have been a bit lower, was it? Slightly, but I think it was much. just about a tone lower. Um, but even then, the high notes are still a bit of a stretch. Um, so it was weird, definitely singing "Run" um, a, a year or so later after I'd sung it so much in 2020. Yeah, that definitely was quite strange. And I sang it at the uh, Darwin Tower Jubilee Queen's Jubilee event as well. Uh, and I remember that, that my voice was not liking going high then. That was six that was, months later. That was six months later. So another six months. It's the same same track as well. So my voice had c- dropped considerably, changed considerably by then. Um, and it was, I remember uh, being, I say backstage, but there wasn't really a stage. It was just like a tower. behind the tower, yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember uh, being like, oh, I can't get that high note. And I m- remember my singing teacher just saying, just plant your feet into the ground um, and the adrenaline should work its magic or as Dominic says a doctor theatre which definitely came and helped uh, at the Albert Hall as well with my cold well cold and changing voice Mm. now I've got to bring this up Cormac on the subject of singing high notes yes (laughs) because I think it was last June when I came to see you or you came to see me Mm -hmm. I had you singing Stanford in G Magnificat do you remember at our house. Yes, it was at your house. The one time. You're denying it, but you did. Don't remember. Yeah, you only did it for fun. It wasn't a serious thing. Is that the. the, 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 the oh, gosh, the, I'm not the, going the, to the, the, attempt to stand. Soul, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Mind. By the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's be. And it's got a dilly 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 yeah, organ part. You're welcome. Um, Do you remember singing? Thank that? you, Matthew. Very roughly. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, <laughs> But there was a serious point. It was to demonstrate that you could do it um, because there are boys, and we'll talk about Chorus of the Year in a little while, Mm -hmm. but there are boys your age who still sing soprano or treble um, and they are just as physically on as you are. Um, So... It's interesting that people can do this because they're using a part of their voice that you prefer not to use. Falsetto. Um, Falsetto is a controversial word. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it the M2 register, which is when your vocal folds are stretched thin and vibrate, not totally closing and just at the edges... Um, now, call that falsetto if you like, but it is possible for a boy to produce a pretty good soprano sound in the M2 register yeah. if they want to. Now, I'm sure I have it in my book somewhere. Cormac says, I don't want to be a choir boy. Tell us about that, Cormac. Um, well, I guess I've kind of just moved away from that now. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, technically, I probably could still sing that right now, just it wouldn't sound as good because it's in my M2 or falsetto. Um, and it's... It just sounds a bit... Oh, yeah, go cool. on, yes. No, Give a stand no, for the no, G. no. <laughs> um, but, yeah, technically I can't I can do it. It just doesn't sound the same as when it did when it was my treble. It sounds a lot more... Um, 
not as the diction's not as good and it sounds more like it's more in like a ooey ary vowel rather than the e's and the air well you're certainly right about vowels because yeah. um all sorts of funny things happen to vowels when you get up to that yeah pitch, definitely. all to do with formants and things yeah. which we won't go into detail here yeah but, but it, it feels i think my treble voice is a lot more i don't know how to describe it like clear um but I sing, feel when I was singing, when I sing in falsetto, just just for a bit of a laugh in the practice room, it's a bit more, like, doesn't sound as good. So where did Chorister of the Year fit into all of this then? Because tell us about that. Um, 2021? Correct. Yeah, Chorister October. of the Year was October 2021. Before BGT. Before BGT, yes. Um... And it was in Salisbury Cathedral. My voice was around about... It was changing, but I was still getting the top A's on Ave Maria. Was it an A or a G? I think it was an A. It was an A, I think. You had no concerns about meeting that? Yeah, there was no, like, worry that I wouldn't get it. Um, It was still quite easy. But I feel like that was when my voice was pretty much at its best. Right. Well, yes, it was. Now, this is the interesting thing. You are right to say your voice was changing mm. on Chorus of the Year. Most boys who get that far, they do have changing voices. We rarely, yeah. rarely hear an unchanged voice on Chorus of the Year. Yeah. For some of the reasons we talked about before, it's the maturity and the musicianship that a mm. 10-year-old's just not going to have. Um but nevertheless, you could get up there, um, and this is partly to do with performance and adrenaline and just being lost in the music, I think. Yeah. Um, if you'd never done the kind of singing you do, um, you wouldn't have been singing notes up in that range. The voice would have gone by then. Yeah. And what I did do, um, <clears throat> I, when you were interviewed by Howard Goodall, whoever it was, I ran that interview through some analytical software to find out exactly where your voice was, and it, it was well interchanged. Cormac, mm. your speaking voice was quite a long way down towards the what we call the two hundred hertz threshold. Yeah. So that's an interesting one. Yeah. And at that point, though, we didn't realise. You know, we thought that his voice was unchanged. Yeah. We hadn't met. Well, you. That's what most people yeah. think. They we don't hadn't. appreciate how soon voice change yeah. actually no. starts. We hadn't met you, mm. and because he was still singing so beautifully and so high, it we were still of the opinion that his voice was still very much just a treble voice. Well, I mean, you talk to people who do a lot of this sort of stuff. I mean, Andrew Nethsinger, who's recently taken up the Westminster Abbey job, I mean, he's on record recently of saying it's year eight Mm. when the boy's voice is at its best that's 12 going 13 13 and voices by that time are changing and this is one of the interesting things Mm. that it isn't the unchanged voice it's the voice that's beginning to change Mm. and i think cormac demonstrated that admirably yeah definitely good i think the chorister of the year was an amazing experience for you as well yeah, wasn't it tell us a little bit about the experience itself um it's quite a while ago now but um it was in salisbury cathedral Judge. yeah when i went for um that was the final thing for the final it? to sing oh holy night it was october singing a christmas song was a bit strange anyway when i once i got onto the stage onto the like the little circle platform thing which he, um, Leslie Garrett decided she needed to go to the loo, so I, I and I, I had to stay on stage for about ten minutes. The piano fell off. The piano. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. The, we start. I started to perform, um, and then the piano stool broke while the pianist was playing, and then <laughs> you couldn't make it. Up. And then so then then they stopped, and then Leslie Garrett thought it was a good idea she to go to, to the go loo. To the um, so then I was on stage for about ten minutes, um, like really really nervous. Um, Standing on the spot. Yeah, uh, with the spotlight on me, so that's quite 
quite nerve wracking. Of course, it's also the cathedral. The loo wasn't just round the corner. Yeah, no. and she had to get unmiked and everything. And the mic had to oh, go oh off, and goodness. then the mic had to go back on yeah, again. So and I'm, sure, I'm sure you've forgiven Leslie, though, just in case she does listen. To yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you're over it now. It yeah, was definitely. more just the fact that it was, you know, the experience itself of being in the cathedral was amazing, and yeah. you know, from that perspective, to sing such beautiful music in such an amazing building was mm. you know a fabulous experience for him and it was unfortunate obviously that the piano still <laughs> fell apart <laughs> it's very interesting to me from a you know um speaking as a teacher now kind of as a music teacher um you know the kind of things that we ask of you were 12 at that point 13 12 13 12 yeah yeah but you know people of that sort of age that would not be in it, generally speaking, you know, the sort of ex- general expectations we would have of a 12 or 13 year old. Um, it's interesting how the rules just sort of go out the window a bit when it comes to art, you know, and it's true of like, you know, when you're working with young actors and stuff as well, as you, you, you um, expect them to behave like professionals and, and mm. in the situation that you're in, when it's, it's music and it's TV. Yeah. And you're expected to behave well more than like a professional, really. You're expected just to do exactly as you're told, to stand exactly where you're told, to wait as long as you need yeah. to, you know, all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I just want. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that would you agree with that? Kind of is it yeah. slightly strange? Um, it was definitely. Um, everyone just kind of expected like all the twelve and thirteen year olds to like almost as if they'd been in the business for twenty years, like professionals. Um, uh, and I think quite a few people found that quite strange being especially treated like it was just normal to like be on stage for a while or like taking instructions from a floor manager and like all that and being mic'd up and all this like special treatment kind of was quite surreal for a lot of us I know um so yeah we were very well looked after though yeah you we know, were definitely I think from that point of view you know the team were excellent but I, I would like to touch on that though from the perspective while we're on chorister of the year I think that is partly a legacy from this kind of traditional chorister kind of um, world, if you like. Um, and I know Martin touches on that in his um, How High Should Boys Sing as well. But, you know, I think you give an example of like a, you know, when the, the, the minister doing a children's address, you know, during oh, the service yes. and turns to the... Daffodil Sunday. Yes, <laughs> no, 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 no children in the, in the congregation are willing to answer. So he turns to the choir and like, no. Not us. We're we're the, we're the professionals, Absolutely. and they are. They are. They Absolutely. are up there, doing mm. as you say, a man's job in a boy's world, um, or whichever we arrange this. A boy's job in a man's world. <laughs> oh, you should be so careful these days. <laughs> and it, girls it, it's an as adult's well. world, and girls can do it as well, well just as well as boys. We have but, that but, yeah. but we're talking about boys just now. Yes, we yeah, are. we are. Um, and um, whether they're boys or girls, they're doing an adult's job, aren't they? They are. And I just. I, yeah, it'd be just good to talk about that. How do you feel about that? Because there's obviously some really good things about that, and then there's mm. some really challenging things about that. So, how would you agree with that? And yeah, well, I guess when you're that age, really, you just kind of just take it on the chin and just don't really think much of it until someone points it out. Like you just did. Like I didn't really think about it much until it was just pointed out. Um, so I think it's kind of just the norm, which I guess it shouldn't really um, should be treated a bit differently, and. Um, yeah. Well, I think people often underestimate people of your age, Cormac. Yeah. I, I've always thought that. Um, it's why I've enjoyed doing the work I do, because um, give you know give you the chance and other you know young people, absolutely. Yeah. So this this business of you, the young professional. Mm. There's a lovely bit in the new book, Cormac, where I've transcribed an interview with you. We did about eight, nine months ago. And you are um, complaining about the other boys at school accusing you of being an opera singer. Yes. Tell us about that. Um, Well, it's just people kind of when they hear like the la, kind of just expect, um, assume that it's opera. Um, which it, it isn't, which is quite annoying. Um, not really happened recently, but when people would be like, oh, Cormac, give us a rendition of your opera or something like that. I'm like, oh. Do you think they're just winding you up or are they genuinely no, they're ignorant? Just genuinely ignorant. Really? Um, yeah. And wanting to wind him up. Yeah. Yeah, probably a bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because, I mean, this is not the first time I've come across this in yeah. my work. Um, I, you know, um, <clears throat> constantly any voice that is accomplished and in a high register uh, to the, you know, kids at school, it's opera. Yeah. Um, so that's an issue you have to deal with. But tell us a bit more about how you get on with the, uh, your peers, as they call them, other pupils your own age um well when i was younger it was a bit more um and when it all started off people were like asking me questions and some people found it really cool and there was the people like oh that's really cringe cormac i'm like okay um or like there's just people being nasty about it saying oh cormac your 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 song's so bad or something like that and maybe you can be talk about when you were at primary school age you know nine ten eleven and now that, you know, people are growing up a bit, 13, 14, 15, is there a difference there? Um, well, I feel like since the people have grown up with me, since it's changed, since I've become kind of like a bit of an online, like, uh, person, uh, and my my personality is online, uh, people are kind of just used to it and don't really think twice about it. And they're like, oh, that's really cool, Cormac. And that's enough said. Or like, oh, I like your new song, Cormac, and that's it. Or there's the, the people that kind of take the mick. But that's not really recently. That was more when I was younger. Um, but now it's just it's kind of just normal and people know it's there and it's not really said about much anymore. Yeah, That's interesting because that I've heard, you know, times before and, you know, because I've been doing this work a long time. And yeah. The Mickey taking goes on more in primary school and yeah. with the younger age groups, which I suppose is not surprising because at secondary school people are maturing a bit more. And, yeah. Yeah. So that is your experience. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. Any difference between girls and boys' reactions? Um. Probably to avoid that question because I went to a boys' school. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Yes, I was forgetting that. Um, that's an interesting one, though, isn't it? Um, do you think... Well, let's put the question another way. You go to a boys' school. Well, he doesn't I lie. went to a boys' school. You went to a boys' school. Yeah. Well, what do you go to now? A girls' school, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> this is going really well. <laughs> They're having great fun in the control room. We were talking a minute ago about the mickey taking is more likely to happen with younger children now you were at a boys only school when you were younger and you're now at a co-educational school Mm -hmm. do you think that's made a difference as well as apart from just getting older no i don't think so maybe I only ask because um in some of the boys i've spoken to in the past um they started to get girl fans in their teenage years yeah. that they wouldn't have had before. Are you, not you? Uh, I don't. <laughs> not not really. No. Interesting. Your face says otherwise. But <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put you on the spot there. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, but it does raise this whole question of who your audience is as you grow and mature how does what we call the demographic of your audience change or does it because the time is going to i think it's true to say cormac disagree if you like but when you're a young treble most of the people listening to you would be old enough to be your mother or your grandparent. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, you can't be a grandson all your life. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get older. How's the relationship with audiences changing already, and how will it change? Um, well, I guess I've got a very mixed demographic of people that listen to my music. Um, there is quite a few young people that do listen to my music. Um, not necessarily in England, it's more um, overseas mixture of different areas. Um, but uh, it w- definitely is the more older side of people. Uh, but as I'm getting older, I think it's more they don't really want to listen to a um, teenage singer rather than they'd more li- likely want to listen to a, a treble singer with the more, I think it's the sweet, innocent tone that quite the 
older people quite like. So, yeah. If well, I could just intervene there just as well, mm. though, I think from my perspective, um, Cormac actually is really very fortunate because not just with his singing, there is the person that he is and the engagement that he gives to his audience beyond his singing. And I would say, actually, that whilst we know that, of course, there are people who love treble singing and who have followed Cormac because they love treble singing, and yes, of course, you know, that's what they want to do and they will move on and listen to other treble singers as they start to come through, there is actually an awful lot of people who go out of their way to comment on Cormac's videos where we have new voice to express their support for him through his voice change and how willing and keen they are to continue to listen to him singing and to support him when he gets to his more adult voice stage. And we're actually, you know, very grateful for that because this is very much uncharted waters for us as, you know, a team of people that work with Cormac as he sings through his voice change. And I've been really very pleasantly surprised at how supportive well, people I, have been. Well, I think been. I need to say I have been as well because, you know, boy travels come and go. Mm. And you're great for a while and then your voice has changed and the next one comes along. Um, but I think part of your success, Cormac, is you're more than just a boy treble. Mm. You're, you're an artist. Mm. And there is evidence that you're taking your audience with you. And like your mum says, there have been some very supportive comments. And it's you they're supporting, I think. Um, they like you as a mm. performer. And we're very grateful for that yeah, because, definitely. you know, one of the things that we were very conscious of was, as you say, boy troubles come and then they go. Cormac alluded to it earlier as well and they disappear and then they come back when mm. they're 16 or 17. And we didn't ever have a plan beyond when his voice changed, we would stop doing what we are doing. And actually, it's been the support of the people who have been on this journey with him that has actually encouraged us not to stop. But that is only possible because Cormac has been very fortunate that his voice change has been a relatively stable change mm. and he is also now able to record in his new voice without sounding like the neighbour's cat. You know, I mean... And we just never knew whether that would happen well, or not. Well, yes, I mean, we were worried about this a year ago. Yeah, absolutely, we, we very were. Very concerned. Now, you're you're right. Um, Cormac is very talented, but he's also been lucky. Absolutely. Um, the way his voice has changed has gone actually very well. Um, there is a phase, call it the high mutation, or in Cooksey speak, it's stage three or mid voice two A. You went through that in about two or three months, Cormac. When you, your mother says, like the neighbour's cat, mm. um, you weren't going to sing in public. Yeah. Um, but that happened quite quickly for you. Yeah. And I was looking at, you know, uh, analysis of your new new voice only this morning, actually. Yeah. And you have been lucky. Um, it's coming back and it's developing interest in its harmonic content quite a lot more quickly than a lot of voices do. Yeah. So in your case, I think a combination of talent and luck. And it's great yeah, that you're taking your audience with you. But are we at the end of the journey yet? In the next episode, we will pick this conversation up again. Thank you so much for listening, and for those who watched it on my YouTube channel, thank you so much for all of your lovely comments, we really do appreciate it.